We're so excited to have Senator Maria Cantwell with us today. She is a former Seattle Tech executive, first elected to the U.S. Senate in 2000. She leads the Senate's Commerce, Science, and Tech Transportation Committee and has been a longtime leader in tech policy. She's joining us today to speak about the future of American innovation. Please join us in welcoming to the stage Senator Cantwell. Thank you so much, have a seat. Thank you, Lisa. My pleasure. So Senator Cantwell, we're coming into the home stretch of the GeekWire Summit, and I thought we could start with a softball question, or maybe a baseball question. Yes, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the last time the Mariners made it to the playoffs was 2001. It's also the year that you were sworn into the Senate. It might be a coincidence, we're not sure. Um, but with the big game coming this afternoon. Yeah, we have to here. definitely be done before the game. Yeah, okay. we promise. We, <laughs> we got to get. Up. We got to get to our locations where we are going to watch this game. Yes, exactly. And so, what are your predictions for the playoffs? Well, the Mariners have great pitching, and pitching usually wins. All right. Okay. Good. <laughs> <That's, laughs> okay. Excellent. And staying with sports for just a minute, um, your Wikipedia bio has an additional little sports tidbit in there. Your time at Real Networks, they say among your accomplishments was the live internet streaming broadcast of a Mariners-Yankees game in 1995, which marked the start of internet broadcast for Major League Baseball games, which is kind of a curious um, little piece of information. Yeah. Well, that, that was an accomplishment by everybody on the team, yeah. obviously the people who wrote the software code, the codex, and Obviously, I was in charge of marketing, mm -hmm. so we wanted to demonstrate that you could have a live broadcast, but I, I'm not even sure if the clip exists. I wish it existed. It is such a great clip because what happens is it is the first baseball game broadcast on the internet, and it's a Seattle Mariners versus New York Yankees, and the interchange between Dave Niehaus and Rick Riz is so great. I mean, you know, they're calling balls and strikes, and then you know, Rick Riz says, oh yes, we're, we're on the internet. We're, we're, we're getting, you know, we're getting communications from people in London and people who haven't heard. And, and uh, um, Niehaus says something about the World Wide Web. We're going to get a lot of letters. <laughs> and Rick Riz, Rick Riz says, Dave, they don't send letters, they send <laughs> emails. So it was like old school versus new school. But anyway, what a great moment. And, Really, when you think about you know a broadcast achievement, um, it was just really bringing pe people were sending in all sorts of emails that they had not listened to an American game in so long, and just you know the whole romanticization of that uh, an announcer like Dave Niehaus can give to baseball. Oh my gosh, that a great great treat for people who were living all across the United States and around the world. Yeah, that's phenomenal. I mean, and, and we've still come so much farther, obviously, since that. Um, you know, I'm wondering, when you reflect on Seattle's evolution in technology, what changes really strike you? Oh my gosh, somebody needs to write a, a book or a movie and categorize it. Uh, uh, we have a friend who was in that movie, Hype, that you know, chronology, chronology of all the um, things that happened in the music scene mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s here, but somebody should, you know, write the definitive story about the milestones of the internet or, you know, tech development that happened here because mm -hmm. it's still ongoing, it's still unfolding, but there's a lot, a lot of story to be told there. Yeah, and you know, with that experience you had, is in, in the late 90s and then going into the Senate, what did you take from that that, you know, affected your role as a senator? Well, I, I would just say this one thing about this point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was working in software, it was really hard to attract people here. You know, people would say to us, well, I don't, I don't know if it's gonna work out. If I go to the Valley and it, and it doesn't work out, I'll have lots of options. And the biggest thing that's transformed in my mind is that now, I mean, everybody's here. You know, all the companies are here. And in fact, we're the number one STEM city in the country. And the great work that the University of Washington does and everybody. So it's a different, the, the transformation has been that Seattle has become its own center and focus. And um, that, that built a lot more capacity, I guess, a lot more capacity for other 
people to get together and innovate. Mm -hmm. And were there specific experiences or lessons you took from working in a really fast-moving, innovative sector like tech that you brought to DC when you took your role in the Senate? Mm, tech meets bureaucracy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, those are two different worlds. Uh, definitely tried to bring the fact that information and data is the key, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely try to bring that every day to the job. But. Um, Yes, two different worlds, two different worlds, and, and obviously uh, coming closer together, but the fact that people don't really, um, you know, people always had information and data in Washington, D.C., but now you have so much more information and data. And I think that, you know, in the tech sector, people are so used to processing that. I would say here in the state of Washington, we're used to processing that. I mean, science is not a bad word in Seattle, okay? But uh, in the other Washington, sometimes people poo-poo science. Well, that's, I, I wonder, because it, is, it feels far away in a lot of different ways. Um, how do your colleagues in DC perceive the tech sector? Well, that's a good question today. I think, I think there's 100 senators, so there's probably like 100 different opinions about the tech sector. But the tech sector is changing so much. And if you're an established brand, and people know you and you've established trust, I think, you know, there's, uh, you know, good, good relations. But, you know, all these issues about privacy, about um, antitrust, about, you know, they're going to, they're going to be there and uh, the sector has to step up and try to address them. Right. Well, and you know, last week, some of your colleagues, um, Senator Warren and Washington's Representative Jayapal, he was talking to the FTC and urging it to not approve, um, for example, this uh, Amazon's pr proposed acquisition of the Roomba um, vacuum manufacturer. What, what are your thoughts on how and if tech needs to be reined in? Well, I think there are a lot of issues, as I said, between you know, privacy and, and uh, market power that are going to continue to involve, evolve. We live in an information age. And I do think that the agencies in charge you know, should look at those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not to say that we can't legislate. It's just that we, we need the agencies to do their job. And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we face is that some people like the FTC to be a little more toothless. I actually feel like the FTC should be a robust agency in the information age. They can be helpful. We passed a law basically saying that, you know, first time offenses when it related to COVID, because there were COVID scams, you could actually stop those individuals and stop those companies. I thought that was a great, you know, change to the law. So I think start with these agencies and what their responsibilities should be. Okay. Um, looking at some of the policy that you have done related to technology, you recently had a really big win with the Chips and Science Act. Um, this bill provides about $280 billion to reboot semiconducting, semiconductor manufacturing in the US. It also bolsters education and basic research. Um, and it's, it strikes me as very interesting because the US was where these chips were first created. Um, they're super pervasive. One expert says almost anything with an on-off switch today has a chip inside of it. So how did we get into this position where we've lost this ability to produce these? Well, I don't know if there are any people in hardware in, in the, on the chip side of the equation out in the, out in the audience, but uh, they can tell you that we basically just lost market share. We used to be at about 36% of the manufacturing of semiconductors in the United States, and we slipped to about 12%, and we're really on our way to going even lower. Mm -hmm. And you can look at there were several factors that drove that, but the most important thing is, did we want to continue that slide or did we want to change that? So with the Chips and Science Act, we were able to make a major investment in trying to bring that supply chain back to the United States. And boy, look at what's happened since we've passed that legislation. You have major announcements by Intel, Qualcomm, Micron, SEH, lots of different people saying, no, we want to be in the United States. We want this manufacturing to be in the United States. So we think it's unleashing the response from the private sector that we wanted to see mm -hmm. with a little bit of investment in you know, the, the, the US infrastructure to help get that kind of 
um, concentration ecosystem, if you will, get that ecosystem here in the United States. Very important, very important for a lot of different reasons. And you mean, but you still even had some critics in your own party with you know, Senator Sanders um, calling it a handout to manufacturers um, with concerns that it's the government meddling in the private sector. Why is it, how do you defend that? How do you say this is the right approach to? Well, when you think about chips being in every aspect of our lives and the fact that we were about to lose that focus as a country, there are a lot of things on the security side that could just make you very comfortable with saying this is a very important decision. We cannot lose the advantage on making the most advanced chips for military reasons, and certainly you don't want to lose them for other uh, reasons. But I think my colleagues who uh, think about tax policy in general, you're incenting. Some of these are tax credits. And you're incenting the private sector to make an investment. So that level of investment is already, you can already see it. You can already see it. So the act, if you were looking at it from a financial perspective, is definitely worth the investment. You can already see that return. OK. Well, and you raised the, the security question. Um, in researching the evolution of that policy, one piece that was really interesting to me was um, one of your strategies for getting this approved. The way I understand it is that you organized classified briefings with committee members, and then you had briefings with the whole Senate um, regarding the national security risks that were faced if we didn't address this CHIPS issue. Um, can you explain what that risk is? Can you unpack that a little further for what is at stake? Well, I can't really tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the pieces you can discuss. I can't really tell you, but I can tell you that um, we have secure information rooms that we all go to. And we bring in the you know, relevant agencies. You can imagine who they are. And we have conversations about the impact of this. And these are great times for members to, to interact with agency directors or the head of the military and, and or chief technology officers within the various agencies and ask very specific questions. Now this is something if you're on the Intel committee or you're used to doing all the time, but for other members, they weren't as used to doing this and particularly on this subject, but I can tell you as we had a conference, which was the one of the few times the Senate's had a conference committee in a long time, and I very much appreciate the fact that you have a legislative process that's transparent, that people can see, they understand what's going on. And in this case, the members of the conference actually came down to the SCIF, which is the secure room, and had these conversations. And the conversations after they left, people were ready to go. People were like, let's get this bill done. Let's, let's get this uh, over the goal line. And we also had uh, at a point when, I, you guys might remember the Senator McConnell said, oh, well, I'm not going to let you do this bill if you're going to also do the Inflation Reduction Act. We're not going to let you have both. Mm -hmm. And so we had to uh, bring in a cadre of people to talk about why it was so important to have this investment. Now, at the time, people didn't realize that we passed this bill out of the United States Senate a year before. But everybody around the globe kind of woke up too and said, wait, the United States of America is going to make an investment in semiconductors? Well, and they'll go if they make investments, they'll come there. So literally in the time we passed the bill out of the Senate, Europe had put a package on the table and were ready to basically give those resources as an incentive by October of this year, by October. And so we just said to our colleagues, are you, are you kidding? We've passed this bill and you're going to now let this investment go to Europe instead. They're, you're going to be buying chips in euros. Let's not do that. And that became a compelling message to the Republicans that, well, wait a minute, maybe the leader overstated this. Maybe, <laughs> you know, the, maybe we'll have a skinny version of this bill. And that is how we got people to say, well, wait, we, we used that as a rallying cry to show that the United States was being watched. We were being watched around the globe. Could we pull this off? Could the institution of Congress that seems so divided, so partisan, so you know, dwelling on misinformation, could you really come together 
and do something as successful as passing this legislation? And the answer, the answer was yes, but we, we needed a few, a few things out. In the middle of this, Intel had already announced that they were gonna break ground in Ohio, but they said, well, I'm putting this on hold until this legislation pass. And that also was a wake up call because listen, we haven't seen a lot of big manufacturing announcements in the Midwest. So it was huge announcement that Intel said they were gonna go to Ohio. But the fact that they said, well, wait a minute, maybe that's gonna go to Europe too, literally got people off their duff and we got the bill done. That's, it's a fascinating to watch that path. I don't know how you have the patience to navigate all of that. Yeah, I don't say I kept my patience all the time. But, uh, <laughs> but I, did, I did keep my eye on the ball. And, and that was that, listen, representing Seattle is one of the greatest honors that I have and the level of innovation. I just feel like I just take what you guys do and I go back there and I try to you know, emphasize it. And I knew, I knew that we had to get this done. I knew that we had to get this done. And, and I think it will be paying dividends. It, it is already paying you know, important investment signals. We are seeing them now, but this is about the United States continuing to be a leader in innovation. The competition's real. I mean, the competition from around the globe is real, but the United States can continue to lead, and that's what this is about. Well, and the, the legislation the piece that maybe gets overlooked a little bit is how much investment there is into um, basic research with Department of Energy, with NASA, with National Science Foundation, um, covering just a wide range of different areas um, of scientific research. And yet, you know, China still really outpaces us tremendously by orders of magnitude in that. I mean, do you think your colleagues with this will maybe start to appreciate and, and rethink investments in this kind of basic R&D that we always were so good at? Well, we were, there were probably divisions. There were some people who just wanted to bash China, you know, because that's what they wanted to do. Uh, but we tried to say this issue of the United States doing a lot of publishing, particularly at universities. Think about it, we have great institutions, they publish a lot of research. Well, that doesn't mean that they're patenting a lot of the research. That doesn't mean they're translating a lot of the research. It means they were publishing. And what was happening is people were reading those publishings and they were implementing them in other places. And so really communicating this notion of translational science. How do we take what we do in innovation and translate it faster, kind of the DARPA model of how do we take this problem, solve it, and implement it into a real solution today? That was one of the key aspects of the legislation. So we literally, besides doubling the NSF, the National Science Foundation budget, we set up a new tech directorate. The job of that tech directorate is to help translate some of that research into opportunities within key sectors that we named in the bill. You can imagine what they are. You know, obviously, like computing and quantum and you know, aviation and uh, you know, green energy, a lot of the, the similar things. But so, so, and how do we do that? How do we take that tech directorate and how do we also uh, create uh, more capacity to build out those technology solutions. So that was a very key part of the bill. And at first, very controversial. Uh, let's see, maybe controversial. Some people were like, no, I just want NSF to keep doing what they do, basic research, let's just do that. And then some people were worried that the NSF budget would get uh, overshadowed by the tech director. And so this, but this was, this was literally saying, we wanna kind of dust off our R&D skills at universities, at NSF, at DOE and just keep our eye on how to help manufacturers translate the science faster into application because why? Because we're facing competition from people around the globe who are doing the same thing. Well, are there other technologies or even supply chain with metals or different pieces of this you're concerned about the gap between what the US is capable of and what other countries are doing and our reliance? Well, there's a lot on the material science side. I, I, Obviously, you know, representing an aviation state, there are lots of changes in aviation. We saw this great event out at Moses Lake a week ago with, a, with an electronic flight. Uh, but everything is about lighter weight materials and thermoplastics and the way that you manufacture composites 
is something the Europeans are looking at. It's something that we need to do um, more work on here. And I think this is where these notions of a tech hub or a tech center, how does a geographic region increase its capacity to look at a specific manufacturing process or technology so that it can continue to be on the cutting edge. And so there are lots of things that I think our state is looking at in this area, like, as I said, thermoplastics. A lot of people would like us to be a hydrogen hub. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of people would like a, a, a bio, biotechnology hub here. There's a various ideas, I think, you know, that people will be pursuing. Right. Um, and looking, again, at the political process, that this was a pretty unique example of a bipartisan effort, really big yes. bipartisan effort. Do you have confidence that there will be other bipartisan measures passed in coming years? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the pause. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my one of my colleagues said to me during this process. He said, he said, Maria, you know that only 50% of the people here want to do business; the other 50 want to do politics. And I thought about that, and I thought, is that really the right number? Is that really <laughs> the right number? Um, I, there are definitely a large number of members that are there that still want to work across the aisle, want to get things done, and will collaborate. They're there. Obviously, Todd Young is one who worked on this legislation from the very beginning and uh, was a great colleague to, to work with us on this. And I think it's, you know, you got to just push aside the fact that the information age has also torn back all of this uh, process and, and can make it a lot more political instantaneously. And then it, it makes it harder. when. When we pass the bill out of the Senate, the immediate next thing, well, not the immediate next thing, because nothing happened for some time, uh, but eight or nine months later, almost a year later, the House passed a bill, but it was a partisan. Only the Democrats supported it. And so all of a sudden, even the senators who had supported the bill were getting criticized on Fox News for supporting the Chips and Science bill. And so they were, our, they were very anxious about the fact that it had turned politically, political so quickly. Yeah. So that's, that's the issue. How do, how do we take the politics out of most of these situations and turn them into this really healthy discussion that I see happening in our state? I mean, literally people who don't agree, I'm not even sure they like each other, are sitting down at the table and coming to resolution Again, based on science and based on information. And if, if, if Congress can stick to that, I guarantee you we can make a lot of progress. Well, I mean, we, we have the midterm elections coming up quickly. And you still have a lot of really interesting tech legislation that you've been working on for a long time with net neutrality, digital privacy, removal of space junk. That's a really interesting new one that you've got. Um, how do you think that the midterm elections could affect your ability to pass some of those measures? Well, it'll, the midterms will decide who controls the United States Senate. It's already a very tight 50-50, and so um, you know, that, that could change um, dramatically. And so it means you know, we, have, we have work to do, and we need to keep discussing it in a bipartisan, bicameral fashion. And, and I'm hoping that people will, will do that regardless of the outcome. But, um, you know, obviously, we want to see, you know, progress on these important legislative pieces. Um, you've been working on a lot of these measures for many years, and I we wonder what the experience was like during the Trump administration, during the time when the Republicans were in, in control of Congress. Um, you're not a fan of President Trump. I think it's okay to say you came out twice in support of his impeachment. And I wonder, on a personal level, what that was like. What kept you going on these measures you believed in and these policies that you were passionate about with such headwinds? Was there a role model you looked to or a time in history that gave you some kind of hope or 
direction to keep pushing through on, on legislation you really cared about? Well, there were days when that song, We Shall Overcome, came to mind in the context of, because the next line is, someday. It doesn't mean you're going to doesn't mean you're going to overcome that day. It means someday. And, uh, you know, I did, I did, I think, make statements that I wish I could tattoo the word science on his arm, not because I'm trying to give somebody a tattoo, but just the <laughs> fact that I really wanted him to understand how important science was to us in making progress. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think he finally, you know, showed, well, at least in Bristol Bay, where we have, there was a proposed gold mine, and the gold mine would have ruined the headwaters of our salmon runs, and we thought that was a horrible idea. Um, you know, in the end, I think one of his sons got him to agree that, yeah, that probably wasn't such a good idea after all. But you just try to get people to listen to what you think are the important messages about um, how, how to make progress. And, and yes, it was a very, challenge, very challenging time from, from that perspective. And we, I definitely didn't see eye to eye on trade policy. We're a very trade dependent state. We definitely want to open markets. We want to see access to our product. And obviously digital trade is huge. And coming to resolution on digital trade was something we didn't, we didn't see as much progress as we wanted to see. Um. You know, we have the passage of Chips and Science, there's the Infrastructure Law, there's the Inflation Reduction Act, all working to address global warming, um, which I know is an issue you're concerned about and tracking carefully. What is not yet sufficiently addressed by some of our policies? Well, we could have. I th so in the Chips and Science Act, we really were trying to unleash the level of investment by investors in the United States in the manufacturing process. And I do think that there is still things to be done to unleash more investment in battery technology in the United States. I think there's some of it that is happening, but I think we could be sending more signals and more would come in a rapid fashion. I definitely am a big fan of uh, use of fiber in broadband. I think we need to step up our security layer. I think we need to step up our, what I would say is a um, smart grid, a two-way communication. It's, you're not going to get to this level of automobile uh, deployment on electric vehicles without a smarter, more powerful, intelligent grid. And we need to get about doing that. And uh, I think it's very important if the United States could say, we are going to be a leader in the transformation. I authored the first tax credit along with uh, Orrin Hatch and then Senator Barack Obama on uh, electric vehicles. You know, that was 20, 2000 and, I don't know, early one, two, three, I, somewhere in there. Um, I think so Obama was in the Senate, President Obama was in the Senate then, so it must have been a little later. But that has now, we can see the evolution of electric vehicles and so important to us because we have cheap electricity, but we have to take these steps. And if the United States would continue to make the investments in making the grid smarter and making uh, the battery technology incentive for manufacturers to be in the United States, I really think we would be unleashing a much larger uh, response to this to this crisis here in in the United States, and I think that's good. I think I think that we we have what it takes to make this transition. I think we have the people, the, the innovation, uh, but you know there are steps in that process, and that's the those. I'm not sure all of the incentives. You know, we will have a discussion before the end of the year on um, these policies, and maybe they'll be in future future bills. What I wondered, too, is you're crafting policy in this space, um, looking at some of the actions from the Supreme Court, which now is very solidly conservative. Um, during their last session, undid some protections for um, pollution from power plants. They're looking now at some, some water um, pollution-related issues. When you're crafting legislation, 
Do you look at it through the whole lens of what might happen in the judicial branch as well to impact the legislation? Is that a consideration? Well, you have lots of lawyers who work for you, so yes, <laughs> the constitutionality is a question that comes up, but or just the legal. But I think really the, the issue is what is good policy that is going to enable, I mean, so many people here work in tech, they understand that it's a process, right? How do you solve anything within your own companies? It is about that process that you undertake to get to the next step, the next level of innovation. And with legislation, instead of being grandiose, uh, really think about what will help us solve that next step to the problem. And when you think about where we are with um, the electric vehicle market, which is very interesting, we should probably chart out. Here are all the things that have happened in the last decade. I, I just always talk about how the uh, presidents at the State of the Union always want to talk about the future. They talk about our problems, they talk about international policy, and then they talk about the future. Mm -hmm. And the way that Bush and Obama, and I can't remember whether Trump did it, to a certain degree maybe, they all talked about electric vehicles. When they wanted to talk about the future, <laughs> they'd say, and we're gonna have electric vehicles, and they're gonna be, the so practically every one of Bush's statements for State of the Union mentioned it, and so did Obama. And then we got to a point where Joe Biden, like, he's not mentioning it anymore because it's here. It's no longer the future. Yeah. It's here. And uh, yeah, clap for that. It's very important it's that we've made this <laughs> milestone. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that's the one thing, you know, I would depart with, I see we're almost out of time, is that, that not, I mean, change does happen incrementally. And that is what, how it happens in tech. It happens incrementally. Yes, there are big shifts when you play your... A, a baseball game on the radio, yeah, that was a that was a sea change, but sea change. But in in reality, there were various incremental steps. And now, when you take the whole system, thinking that that was 19, um, I don't even remember now, 95, 97, where, somewhere in there, and look at where we are today. Everybody's going to watch that game today on a digital device, handheld, probably reading stats as they go. And so look at the short period of time, how big of a sea change that is. But it still happens incrementally in these steps of, of making advancement. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. I mean, it, sometimes it feels like it's going slowly when you look at the climate crisis. But um, like I say, we're certainly making progress. And I mean, are you hopeful for the future? There's a lot of uncertainty at the midterms. You know, a lot of people concerned about dem democracy just Fundamentally, what, what are your thoughts? We're going to do the looking forward. Well, in, in, I'm hopeful for the future because I come from the state of Washington. So we are hopeful by, by nature about the future. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, We're go so M's. glad to have you.